So in this video, I wanted to talk a little bit about the stock market and also a little bit about cryptocurrency. And I want to give an overview. I'm getting lots of questions from students about the stock market, understandably, because the stock market is such an abstract concept that there are many questions that we feel compelled to ask. And one of them is about the changes in the stock market. So here's a graph showing this is You've probably seen something like this. Anytime you see the stock market, you see a graph, something like this. And you're seeing the, fluctuation, the fluctuations in the stock market over time. Here we're going from 2017 through 2020. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And you see that there's tremendous fluctuation in the value here. It's all, it's ticking all over the place. So some questions I get about this um, are, who decides the price of a stock? And... Why do stocks go up and down? And that's a little bit of what we'll talk about first before we look at cryptocurrency. So these are our two questions, and I, I like them because it just reflects um, how difficult it is to think about the idea of the stock market in comparison to the way we think about other things, like the prices of items in a store, for example. We have a lot more behind this process. And... Why do they go up and down? That is a really big and interesting question. So let's take a look. So let's start with who decides the price of a stock. So the, the stock prices themselves is somewhat of a natural and automatic process. There is not necessarily someone who's sitting there determining uh, right away what each stock price will be worth. It's not really that kind of process. And I pulled an interesting analogy from a Quora article that I wanted to share with you. And they say, imagine there's a store, and there are shelves in the store. It's an empty store. And then a bunch of sellers come in, and they're selling tuna. Now, in our case, we'll, have, we'll assume they're basically selling the same type of tuna. And they each have an idea of what the value is that they want to sell it for, right? Maybe the first company wants to sell for $1.25, and then it fluctuates a little bit above a dollar at different prices. So these companies each have their own reasons for setting this price. They want a certain profit. They have certain expenses that they have to take care of, and they know what their revenue is. So that enables them to choose a price. And they list these prices out. This is what the sellers are thinking about selling their tuna. This is what they want to sell it for. So in our case, I guess the tuna is the stock in this analogy. But what will it sell for? What will the price be? Who decides? Well, there's people who are selling it at certain prices, and there are buyers who want to buy it. And let's say a buyer decides they're willing to spend $1.15. They've decided that the tuna is worth that much. They like the tuna. They think tuna has a good future. It's something to invest in. And then I guess the earlier way it used to work is that brokers would essentially match sellers and buyers. They would work as an intermediary to say, okay, this person wants to sell it for that, this much, and this person wants to buy it for this much. We've got a match. And that would then begin to set the price at that moment for that stock. So it's essentially an agreement between a seller and a buyer where they agree on the value of that stock, and then it could be traded at that value. So you see these prices for stocks, and, and you'll see this in the article in class, but basically the price you see is what has just been recently matched. In other words, what it was sold for. What, are you, what do you want to sell it for and what are you able to sell it for? That determines the price. That's really it. It's just a snapshot. That price is a snapshot at a point in time. And it can move really, really fast because there are lots of buying and selling points. And as you might know, computers are becoming more and more involved in this process. So it can happen at a faster and faster and faster rate, which continually moves the price around. And... That gives you a gist of the idea of buying and selling and why those prices move around. But what else is going on in the background? So there's a second article that we're looking at, and it does start off with essentially the same argument. It's about market forces, buyers and sellers, supply and demand. And the prices that you see for a stock will respond in supply to fluctuations or changes in supply and demand. If there's more of a supply than a demand, the price might go down and if there's more of a demand than a supply, the price might go up, just like anything else. But there's more to it. And we can start with supply and that, that helps us make sense of it. But, but, but what else is going on in, in the background, right? What else is going on in the background? 
Well, there's also the, not only is there the supply and demand, but it's also what people believe and what they project and what they see might be happening in the future. If more people really want to sell a stock than buy it, um, that would cause the price to fall. So there is an element of what people desire here and what they think will happen in the future. The supply and demand will change in response to the way people perceive the value of a stock. That's amazing. So we have those market forces. But all of that is tied to the value of a company. If you think about it, stock is representing the value of a corporation. And the idea is that you take the value of a company, how much it's worth, and you look at the number of shares, and that can be used to determine the value of a stock. And that will cause a change. That will change the stock value. So. Um, you basically take the value of the dollar, the, the value of the company, divide it by the number of shares that are out there, and that will tell you the value of each share of stock. So let's say you have companies worth $1,000 and there are 10 shares of stock. Well, 1,000 divided by 10 is 100, so each share of stock is worth $100. Now, if the company's worth $1,000, that could change. And if the, the value in the company doubles, the value in the stock doubles. So instead of going up being 100, it would double to 200. So how does that work? And this is really interesting because a company's value is tied to the value of the stock. But a company's value, it is based on what it has currently, but also what it might make in the future. We're constantly trying to predict what will it make in the future. And the value of the stuff you have might be fairly easy to, to determine. That might be easier to work with, but it's not so easy to think about what's going to be happening in the future. And that ties to those fluctuations. So what we can talk about next is essentially as a summary of this, that the stock market, it, it goes up and down, it fluctuates. And essentially, it's doing that as a response to our predictions about the future. And in the article that I will share with you that connects to this, they will talk about that in a little more detail. So if you think a company is going in a certain direction and it doesn't, you think it's going to improve and it actually is worth less, or the reverse, if you think it's going to do worse and it actually does better, that'll impact the response of the stock market as well. So essentially, our predictions are always inherently somewhat off, which somewhat makes the fluctuations also unpredictable. So will we ever be able to predict the stock market, uh, its, its behavior exactly? This is a question I often get. Let's just say that um, we don't know. Obviously, we can't know that. However, I feel confident in saying, and in much of the literature supports this, is that we won't be able to predict it exactly. And now that measure, that phrase exactly, of course, is hard to measure itself. Like, at what point do you say, we've got it exactly? Um, is it every single nanosecond your prediction is, in, is matching the levels of the stock market? Well, I think that level is unattainable. There are too many fluctuations to account for. However, I think one of the questions really becomes, can we predict it enough to be correct? Enough. And if you're, you know, if you're just doing it above 50%, if you're accurate more than you are not accurate, that's how you can really, I think, take advantage of the market. The, the more accurate you are, the better, of course, but all you have to do is be able to predict it beyond half the time, and then you'll be doing better. Now, that's, that's another way of thinking about it, looking as we look forward in the future, can we be uh, can we can we be accurate enough to be profitable? And I think sometimes the answer is yes. Now we're also in in this video talking briefly about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin because many students are asking me about this. Now what we're basically looking at is is this currency, the idea of currency and money and Bitcoin and um, in, in two ways. We're going to look at a video that gives you an overview, and then we're going to look at a more detailed video that gets more technical. But I really want you to see um, some of the specific ideas behind cryptocurrency and why it's just so effective. Right now, as of this moment, uh, if you look up Bitcoin, you'll see that every Bitcoin is worth almost $50,000. All right? That's amazing. And if you look at the growth over time, you you could say some, you know you could you can see something that's almost unbelievable and 
if you had invested, let's say, $100 in 2010 and haven't touched it, it would be worth over $48 million today. And I'm not saying that we should have done that or that you should have regret if you didn't do this. I'm not saying that this is even a fair predictor because people don't just leave money in something. For quite often, they move it around and sell and adjust. But, but just that fact is gives you a sense of just how amazing this market has become and why so many people are talking about it. We had talked about um, investing other amounts. I mean, if you scale this up, you really start to see, oh my gosh, if you invested 6000 you'd have over $2.5 billion today. So that growth is something to think about. And that's why we're going to talk about this currency because whether or not you think it's a stable investment is irrelevant. And I'm not telling you that Bitcoin is a good investment. And I'm not trying to tell you which cryptocurrency to buy. I'm just pointing out, and I think this, there's agreement on this, is that looking at cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, some of the ideas behind us give us a glimpse into our future with money in general. Because cryptocurrency essentially changes the, the whole system in which we think about money. And one way you'll see that it does that is it decentralizes the process. It gives you a currency that's not tied to any one particular institution or government. And perhaps that's an opportunity for us going forward to help many people who do not have access to the institutions that many of us have access to. So maybe it will help. But I think aside from that, looking at cryptocurrency and its security just how secure and, and fluid it can be and how it's starting to become liquid so you can actually turn it into cash, um, I think we're seeing a, uh, a competitor for any type of currency we have today. So that's another thing that, that makes it interesting. So there's the growth aspect. There's a the technical aspect. How are they doing this? That's really interesting. But also just, just the concept of our, of our society and its relationship to money could be shifting, and this, this gives us a glimpse into that. Thank you.